Welcome to Wellspring on the Air. I'm Tova, president and co-founder of Wellspring Counseling. And we're so glad you joined us today for this show. Today's show is going to be about mental health awareness, mental illness awareness. And we want to just talk about what does it mean to be mentally ill and how do we know that? How do we assess for that? And I have someone extra special with me today on the show. One of our therapists, his name is Dr. Christopher Chung. Hi, Chris. Hello, how are you? Um, Chris, I'd love for you to tell us about that doctorate, about your credentials. Just tell us a little bit about who you are besides being a Wellspring therapist. Um, absolutely. Thank you, Tova, for inviting me. Um, so my name is Dr. Christopher Chung. I have my training in marriage and family therapy in, at the University of Miami. And then I completed my doctorate at the University of Florida. Worked in a variety of settings throughout those times, including a substance abuse facility here in South uh, Baptist as well as in the pediatrics at Shands at, in Gainesville, Florida. And I'm happy to find myself back in South Florida to be working at Wellspring. Well, good. I see some of those credentials on the wall behind you. So <laughs> this is a good topic for you today. I'm just like, bring an expert in and let's talk about what it means to be mentally ill. So let's start with the very top of this. Uh, what is mental illness? Absolutely. Um, and mental illness is also called mental health disorders. It certainly refers to a wide range of um, mental health conditions. I think we talk about anything that affects our thinking, affects our mood, affects our behaviors, can uh, be in that category of mental illness, especially when it affects our daily functioning, affects the, the capacity. We have a variety of them, of course. You, we have depression, anxiety, but also things that along, goes along with the lines of uh, personality, such as, um, schizophrenia or any type of um, obsessive compulsive disorder, personality disorders. So there's a very much a wide range and we want to make sure that we're clear as to which one we uh, are talking about. So practically for our listener here, um, mental illness, you said three key words. So mental illness includes uh, thinking, mood and behavior. So it's an internal mm -hmm. thing. It could be organic or not. It could be learned or like trauma induced or something like that. But it means that what you think and feel on the inside, your emotions or your thinking mm -hmm. is so disturbed or has a pattern of disturbance. I know pattern is a key word for the diagnosis, but mm -hmm. a pattern that basically keeps you from normal, healthy functioning. Yes, so absolutely. if our moods are so extreme, we can't function normally. If our behavior is so extreme, like an addiction, it affects our functioning. Mm -hmm. Or if our thinking is so extreme, like a psychosis, we see things that aren't there. Mm -hmm. So if any of those things are extreme enough that, and in a pattern, we could be diagnosed as having a mental illness. Did I absolutely. summarize lay terms? Absolutely. Uh, okay. Things that are often unseen, right, by many people, but it has a real effect on our lives, on our relationships. So let's talk about that diagnosis term. So we have a diagnostic statistical manual. Um, and so, you know, just like any other doctors, they go and they pull out their, and their books to diagnose things. We in the mental health world do the same thing. So mm -hmm. it is called the DSM. So yes. talk to us about the DSM. Absolutely. So the DSM has been through many revisions and iterations. Certainly it is our guide. It is uh, used as a guide when we want to be very careful uh, as to how we use it. It presents all the different criteria a person uh, needs to meet or patterns that we mentioned about that they are exhibiting uh, it, this, uh, before it's categorized as a disorder. So we're looking for uh, a behavioral or psychological syndrome or pattern that occurs in an individual, right? And um, that to start with, it means that disorders are uh, typically need to meet a certain uh, frequency, intensity, or um, certainly a different type of degree before we can confidently say that this is a mental illness versus um, a, a dysfunction. A dysfunction. Yes. Thank you. 
Yeah. So, I, so to be diagnosed, you actually have to have a pattern of thinking, moods, and behaviors that falls into a category um, of a diagnosis. And it, it talks about frequency, intensity. So how severe is it? How often is it? How much does it keep recurring? And that kind of thing. Um, so give us some of those broad categories, because within DSM, we have big chunks of types of things. So can you yes. list some of those for us? Absolutely. So uh, the DSM has categorized some as neurodevelopmental disorders. So we're talking about anything to do with the brain, anything to do with um, the biological aspects of the disorder, how it can affect it. There's a schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders um, category as well. Uh, we have a bipolar and related disorders, depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, uh, obsessive compulsive related disorders, trauma and stressors related, as well as dissociative disorders. All right. So that's a kind of a fast list of some of those broad categories. But some of the things that would fall in the DSM and the organic realm, like uh, the neurobiological ones might be just de delayed development for a, a child or mm -hmm. ADHD or some of those yes. things that have to do with the brain. Some things relate more to the mood and some things relate more to behaviors like addictions and some of those things. Right. Absolutely. Yes. OK, so. So we get these diagnoses. Now, I will say for our listener that, that at Wellspring, we work really hard not to diagnose people. Um, it's kind of a principle we function under, which is the people who come to us, we don't take a traditional medical model. They, they walk through our doors and we don't see, oh, there's the schizophrenic, there's the depressed person. We see there's a person and this is a, a part of what they're dealing with. So we're very kind of anti-diagnosis. We don't label people. We think of all of us have some level of dysfunction. All is we, we use the phrase, what's the phrase, Christopher? You know what I'm going to say, right? We yeah. are they. Okay. We are they. Yes. <laughs> we are they. That we are just like that. We are just mm -hmm. all people on fellow sojourners on a journey. And so we, we do as good clinicians think through, yes, this person is severe enough, they would fall in this category, you know, once we get to know them, and then how do we, on the basis of that new clinical information, then we would say, okay, I need to treat them in these ways. This is what will work. This is what won't. We want to send them out to a psychiatrist for medication, or we want to help them behaviorally or whatever it is. So the diagnosis is important for us as professionals. It's not very important for the person to have a major label, although sometimes maybe they are relieved to know uh, some of those labels, but mm -hmm. I went on a little diatribe there, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, I just want our, our listener to understand how and why we use these labels. So, so let's move into, so when people come and we are diagnosing, so first of all, we could pull out the manual, the DSM, and we could kind of look at the criteria, but we have other ways of assessing people, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd like to spend a little time and have you teach us what are the different mental health assessments that are available and that we might use at Wellspring or others yeah. need. Absolutely. And uh, I, I really appreciate you uh, discussing how um, we still see people as people and not their diagnoses. And that's mm -hmm. why we're very cautious in the way that we um, present it. We want to be as collaborative as possible. We want to allow them to have ownership of, yes, these are things that are uh, um, affecting my life. So assessments, uh, the methods we use are to better kind of understand their daily functioning in terms of their mood, their behavior, and their uh, cognition, their thinking, like we mentioned. So that's consistent with what, um, how we understand mental health disorder. We want to know the degree, how it affects a person from the smallest degree to one of the more um, the, uh, unhelpful or dysfunctional types of degrees. So kind of trying to capture all of that, but we also want to capture other aspects as well in our assessments, their work, their habits, their leisures, their diet, things that come together that may increase or decrease the level of functioning uh, as it affects the mental health. Um, so that's kind of it in a nutshell, but certainly it's necessary to, um, connect clients to the correct type of interventions that we present as well as be in contact with others like their physicians like their um, whatever uh, physical nutritionist. therapist, nutritionist <laughs> all of those we have a common language this is why we use those these terminologies 
I think it's very helpful to comment on that. At Wellspring, we try to be very holistic in our care and we recognize that, so maybe someone's depressed and we know statistically uh, through research that antidepressants can be very effective. We also know that so can exercise. Yes. And so can some behavioral, some thought changes that we could have that can affect our mood. Uh, honestly, there's good research that being generous or helping, helping others is also a mood lifter. So there are all sorts of things that from a holistic perspective we could do to relate to something like depression, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but like you said, this label, uh, these diagnoses give us some common language to talk to other, you know, medical professionals, nutritionists, sports people, or just for the client to advocate for themselves. Um, so, all right. So what are some assessments that are out there? Absolutely. So we want to differentiate uh, a little bit. They sometimes work together well, but the first one is tests. We want to make sure that we identify or confirm any type of mental illnesses or any types of symptoms. We want to, again, know the frequency, intensity. We want to know how often it occurs. Is it a pattern? We're trying to look for a pattern. We're looking for things that can help us identify ADHD, for example, or depression, or more severe type of phobias. And that will allow clients to know, hey, I'm dealing with something that's really bothering me. It's not just in my head. It's not just something that is, um, I can't handle. It's really, it's a illness. Uh, then we have um, ways of collecting information. Like I mentioned, we want a more holistic view of a client. So we do a biopsychosocial, as we call it, understanding family history, understanding the living situations. We have self-referenced assessment. So we use it more as trackers. How are you doing when we first started? How are we doing over time? Are we reducing those, um, those negative symptoms? Are we increasing more of helpful behaviors? Uh, we use questionnaires for that. So we use some uh, form of uh, Likert scale questionnaires. And then, of course, there is also discovery or inventories, as I like to call them, of understanding a person's interests or things that may uh, help them learn about themselves a bit more. Hey, we use the words introversion, extroversion a lot, but these types of assessment can help us connect that. And that in turn can help us develop a plan for healthier living or maybe a better job environment or better uh, family uh, relationship. Can all of this be captured through assessment? So yeah, these are all the different types that are out there. All right, so I'm gonna review those and then we'll take a quick break and we'll come back and let's kind of give some examples of each one. So we have actual tests that you could take and even like an ADHD that maybe parent, there's a parent form and a teacher form and a kid form, you know? Mm -hmm. So we have tests, we have um, ways that we collect and get some psychosocials. We have self-assessments, we have inventories, discovery inventories. Is that, did, there, mm -hmm. is the four, is that what you had? Yes, yeah. the four, yes. Okay. All right, so let's take a, a quick break and we will be right back. Hi, welcome back. This is Tova with Wellspring on the Air and Dr. Christopher Chung. And today we are talking about mental illness as a whole. How do we diagnose it? How do we assess for it? And if you missed the beginning of this show, you can find us on your favorite podcast channel, Wellspring on the Air. You can find us on YouTube with wellspringmiami.org or link to our website and search in our blog section on any topics you want. This one would be uh, mental illness assessments. So um, Dr. Chung, we've done a good job just kind of talking about the fact that mental illness can be measured. It's not a matter of you have it or you don't. It's a matter of degrees mm -hmm. and the more degrees we have that affect our ability to function in our thinking, our behavior, and our mood. So those are the three broad categories. And when we have patterns of behavior that make us unable to function well, uh, really causing distress in our lives, then we might fall into a category that would be called mental illness. By the way, while we're on that for a moment, what are the statistics about how many people in America? I know you had a stat on this. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, so from the National Institute of Mental Health, we noted that back in 2017, and things may have changed, we're very glad that mental health is not as big of a stigma, but it is still prevalent. And um, we have, there's an estimated about 46.6 .6 million adults. These are just adults we're talking about in the United States. It's roughly a little under 20% of all US adults may have a, or is suffering or uh, facing a mental illness. Uh, so about 20% of the population mm -hmm. suffers from an something that could be diagnosed as a mental illness. Absolutely. Okay, that's like a lot. 
it's it, it's one in lot. every five people we cross. <laughs> yes. And it could, and if we don't know any, it's probably us. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 probably correct. We all that's have a little. Probably true. It's all them. They're all crazy, and I'm good. And and when we say that too often, it, it might be it might be us. So, all right. So the statistics are pretty profound out there on this. But let's let's go back. You talked at the beginning of the first half of the show about types of assessments so let that we can use tests uh, ways of us collecting and interviewing uh, self assessments that are you can reference and go along and then uh, what you call discovery um, in inventory so let's talk about tests give us a couple examples of common tests for absolutely uh, in any uh, if you are in the counseling program the one that they usually present to you is the Bex depression inventory which is often cited um, as one of the most used inventory, but there are others that can help us find if you are reaching the threshold of between regular depression or clinical depression. Once we hit that threshold, we wanna make sure that you're getting the best of treatment. Not to say that if you don't reach that threshold, there's other things that can be done, but it's significant enough where we need to take it more seriously, perhaps even involve a, a, a psychiatry in there. Um, so those are the types of tests that are out there. Some for ADHD, for example, and there, um, the Vanderbilt ADHD inventory is one uh, that's in our instinct system as well. So uh, there's uh, those types. So we have these assessments like for depression, we have anxiety ones, we have trauma ones, we use the PCL5 for trauma um, and looking for symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, you mentioned ADHD, but there are many others out there. And you said a phrase that nobody knows what you're talking about. You said in our in sync system. So let me define that for our listener, which is that we use electronic medical records and we use a mental health electronic medical record system for all of our clients. And in it, we have these assessments, right? So if someone's a client with us, we can, the therapist can send them an assessment through their portal and they can just fill it out right there to go straight to the therapist. And then when they're in session, they can discuss it, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, all right. So I just got to fill in some of these Thank things. You, yes. So, so we have a number of tests that people can, can take. You can, mm -hmm. Well, we can go to it in a minute. People can go online and look for some of these, but these are official ones with actual screening and measures yes. and, and um, they're been proven reliable um, in, in our society. So, so there's official tests and we have a number of those. And then we have ways you kind of mentioned of just kind of collecting data, historical, mm -hmm. and this would be true for instance in PTSD. Um, a good PTSD screening is not just the symptoms, but it's actually a review of is this multiple traumas versus one, that kind of thing. Because sometimes someone who's really um, dissociated, kind of separate from themselves, mm -hmm. they may not show up on all those symptoms because they're not really aware of how distressed they are because they're detached from themselves, Absolutely. if I yes. could put that simply. But mm -hmm. let's talk about these, uh, some of these assessments, like you mentioned, the Beck's depression inventory are what you call self-referencing. Reference. Yes. So talk self about that for a second. Absolutely. And the way that uh, both clinicians and the person themselves, when we know that you have a certain level of um, depression okay. per se, okay. um, and we want to track over time, are we lowering those negative behaviors, negative symptoms, negative thinking, and increasing positive behaviors? So we track this. These are more self-reference. You're not, um, the result is not to compare yourself to the general idea of what depression is, but it, the person itself, are you making improvements? Are you regressing? So those are important information as well and can be used in that manner. Uh, to it's, yeah, and at Wellspring, that's really important to us because it's how we know we've done a good job. When clients come to us, our goal is not to change them. Our goal is to help them meet their goal. So they come in and say, I want, we say, what do you want? You know, well, I want to get up and go to work every day and not want to sleep. I want to feel less nervous when I do X, Y, or Z with anxiety. So we give these tests and they kind of say, wow, I am clinical, or maybe I'm not quite clinical, but I still don't like it. And then we say, well, where do you want to get? And then we, we, they check themselves. Hey, I'm doing better. It's very encouraging to them. It's certainly encouraging to our therapists, right? We mm -hmm. want to know we're effective. Uh, we call this in our industry evidence-based practice. practice. We want to 
prove that people are just better. You could sit around all day and do talk therapy, but if your life isn't changing, if you can't measure those changes in your goals as a client, then I'm not sure, I don't believe we've done a good job. So I, our whole industry has really moved toward evidence-based practice and that's why we use these assessments and why the clients use them to see I'm doing better or I'm not and, and what happened right before that made me not do better and how do I change that? That's, the, that's how we use those self-referencing ones, right? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. And then you had also uh, inventories, so yes. discovery things. So let's talk Absolutely. about a couple of those that are out there. Absolutely, and these uh, are very popular because they, you can take it by yourself, but certainly we want to be careful how you interpret them. Now, the more prevalent or the most uh, one of the more popular ones out there is the Myers-Briggs test uh, inventory or My Myers-Briggs type inventory personality. Mm -hmm. personality. Uh, talks, uh, you hear people share about terminology just like I'm an INFP, uh, ENTJ, so this is where it's coming from. It's helpful for a lot of variety of reasons. For myself, I use them mainly to figure out how people deal with stress, how people recharge their energy, how people, what type of interaction do they prefer. Other people use them to, you know, know what type of job or career they want to pursue. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I think they're encouraging to people to recognize this is the way I'm wired. And so it's really about not just preventing illness, it's about building on our strengths, mm -hmm. using what we're really good at, whether it's getting the right, you're, maybe you're depressed because you're in the wrong job because it's exactly. a terrible match for you. Exactly. So, you know, using these things to say, this is, this is the, the best me, the real me, or, or even to shore up our weaknesses in some of these areas where you know, we're really lean, really strongly to that D and the disc. And, and maybe we need to recognize everybody doesn't always appreciate that all the time or, you know, all sorts of things like that. I think of other things, the Enneagram is out there and is kind of popular. Um, and even in the emotional health world for Christians, I love Peter Scazzaro's stuff. He has the emotionally healthy uh, inventory. And so those are, those are just self checks of how mature am I as a person and mm -hmm. spiritually mature and practically. So there, there are a lot of good ones out there for us to play with and share with our family or our work colleagues. Hey, this is, this is me or not. Right. Yes, absolutely. It's certainly helpful for relational peace. And that can be helpful for people to understand, oh, this is why I don't enjoy this type of setting, the, mm -hmm. this type, this type of um, work, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. so those are great assessments too. Now let's talk before we run out of time about mm -hmm. uh, what happens if people do self-diagnosis mm -hmm. too much or okay. what are yeah, the risks? Absolutely. So uh, there are three things that I would like to touch on. Now the self-diagnosis, of course, we hear a lot when people so uh, go to like WebMD or things like that. We already, physicians would discourage you to self-diagnose in a way. It's helpful to screen, maybe I have certain symptoms, but when it comes to self-diagnosis, oftentimes what we find is people, not people, but individuals may not understand the different degrees that they're experiencing a symptom. So uh, what is the difference between typical anxiety versus a more severe uh, panic attack or anxiety attack? Um, and when it comes to misinformation is that people may engage in different types of treatment or techniques that may not be as helpful. So we want to make sure that you get the best um, accurate information. So use the self-diagnosis temporarily as a screening. Maybe it'll alert you to know, hey, maybe I need to talk to a professional reaching out. Those are appropriate uses for self-diagnosis, but not so much for identifying self as I have ADHD. So now I'm going to excuse my behavior, for example, or say that I can't achieve something because I have what I think is a mental health disorder. Well, and we professionals are not, it's illegal for us to diagnose someone we haven't seen. We might want to diagnose our family members or we might, you know, and we can't do that. And so in the same way that we shouldn't diagnose other people flippantly, oh, he's a narcissist or something, you know, uh, we shouldn't be, we, we may err on ourselves too. And, and uh, I know that all of us, when we went through graduate school, you'll see, tell me if you agree, uh, Chris, yes. but we all diagnosed ourselves yeah. with everything at, 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 all along the way, you know? And so it is a matter of, I think, severity um, and that kind of thing. So we want to be thoughtful about self-diagnosing. Let's talk about undiagnosed. Are there a lot of people who are undiagnosed? 
Yeah, so across even in my training and schooling, it's still very, uh, even though we know about around 20% of United States adults have a mental illness, the number still shows that very few, uh, few seek mental health services and they may have uh, experienced some form of mental health illnesses. We know from stories of families who may have undiagnosed mental illness, right? And that has a lasting effect on how family relationships um, are affected. There may be more fights, anger. I certainly know that in my family, there's a, uh, a depression that goes on that we finally understand. But without that understanding previously, it affected how they raised the children and it sort of um, kind of have a, a, a intergenerational effect. So yeah, I think undiagnosed is important because uh, we all think normal is whatever we grow up with. It's not until we hit our late teens that we discover that other people live differently than we do. Um, and so those diagnoses can, can matter because if we think this is normal and it isn't or it isn't healthy, then like you said, there are intergenerational effects that happen. Um, undiagnosed means untreated. And mm -hmm. so a lot of people could feel a whole lot better with some treatment instead of just beating themselves up for I'm just an, a worried person when really maybe they have a true anxiety disorder or, or maybe, you know, I'm just super rigid, but maybe you've got some obsessive compulsive disorder or things like that. And so we judge each other, we judge ourselves and we don't get treated. So it, it's a Im important thing. Mm -hmm. um, you had, I, we need to wrap up here. Um, mm -hmm. Misdiagnosis happens yes. too? Yes, misdiagnosis absolutely happens. Sometimes we may um, misdiagnose a physical disorder as a mental health disorder, as well as the opposite, where a mental health disorder is uh, diagnosed as a physical disorder, and the treatment, therefore, is affected by it. And so we want to be very careful about that. A quick example I can give, being married to my wife, she noted that certain kids have um, exhibited symptoms of ADHD when all they needed was glasses, but they couldn't communicate that. So that is mm. unhelpful to kind of give a kid a, oh, he's just having poor behavior. He has uh, ADHD. Um, and as well, we don't want to excuse anger or uh, lashing out as, oh, this person just have a personality, a temperamental terms of personality. It could have been a undiagnosed bipolar or misdiagnosed um, uh, as as um, depression, no, the, the misdiagnosed as narcissist, and when it's all, it could be related to depression. A person can exhibit some of the symptoms that um, we typically don't associate with depression, for example. I, yeah, kids acting out when they're depressed and, and the misbehavior. I, I think that one of the most common misdiagnoses, particularly in children, is is trauma. So mm -hmm. one of the symptoms of having uh, traumatic events in your life is being hyper vigilant so you're always nervous and anxious because you're always waiting for the next bad thing to happen and it could be sudden and so those people present as hyper but they're actually just hyper vigilant they're watching out for danger when they not aren't aren't necessarily hyperactive and those are very mm -hmm. different diagnoses so all right we've come to the end of our time done a great job kind of doing an overview of mental illness and and how we assess for it I had uh, one verse that came to mind that I just really like as a mental health practitioner, but is says, for God did not give us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's in 2 Timothy 1, 7. And um, I know you had one there too, Romans. Yes, Romans 12. Um, it is, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Certainly, we want to have a sound mind so we can worship God. And God has given us all the capability of achieving that and uh, taking yeah. care. And on that note, you know, um, God designed us to have whole healthy bodies. And yet he has people born into this world who organically do not have that. And that's true in the mental world, too. We can have organic mental illnesses, genetic or organic or otherwise. And um, so we want to be kind to that. That doesn't mean people don't have enough faith. It doesn't mean they should just pray it away. Um, instead, real good, clear diagnoses are where going to lead us to the best Christian person we can be with our illnesses. We, we treat them as best mm -hmm. we can. We handle them. And then it does free us to worship God um, despite 
and sometimes because of the suffering we have in, in our minds. And so um, on that note, I think we will wrap up. It is time to wrap up with Christopher and Tova today uh, with Wellspring on the air because hearts and minds matter. <laughs>